You're listening to TIP. All right, so once a year, billionaire Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger hold their annual shareholders meeting for Berkshire Hathaway. And like rock and roll groupies, Stig and I cling to their discussions and provide some of the more interesting responses here on our show. So on our episode today, we're going to be playing some questions and answers that address Berkshire's large cash position, their ownership of Apple, their thoughts on managing other people's money, and much, much more. It's always fun to cover this meeting each year, so get ready for our review of Berkshire 2019. You are listening to The Investor's Podcast, where we study the financial markets and read the books that influence self-made billionaires the most. We keep you informed and prepared for the unexpected. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Investor's Podcast. I'm your host, Preston Pish. And as always, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson. And uh, like we said in the introduction, we're going to be talking about the Berkshire meeting. And so what we're going to do is we're going to play the first question that we think that you guys might enjoy. So here you go. My question concerns your repurchase of Berkshire shares. In the third quarter of last year, you spent almost $1 billion buying Berkshire B stock at an average price of $207. But then you got to a period between December 26th and April 11th when the stock languished for almost four months under 207, even as you were sitting on an enormous pile of 112 billion. My question is why you did not repurchase a lot more stock unless, of course, there was for a time an acquisition of, say, 80 billion to 90 billion on your radar. Yeah, the question, whether we had 100 billion or 200 billion uh, would not make a difference, or 50 billion, would not make a difference in our approach to repurchase of shares. We used to have policy of tying it to book value, but that became, really became obsolete. It did, did not, the real thing is to buy stock repurchase shares only when you think you're doing it at a price where the remaining shareholders have had are, are worth more of the moment after you repurchased it than they were the moment before. It's very much like if you were running a partnership and you had three partners in it and the business was worth three million and uh, one of the partners came and said, I'd like you to buy back my share of the partnership for 1.1 million. And we said, forget it. And if he said, one million, we'd probably uh, say forget it. Unless, and uh, if he said if he said nine hundred thousand, we'd take it because at that point the remaining business would be worth two million one, and we'd have two owners, and our interest in value would have gone from a million to a million and fifty thousand. So it's very simple arithmetic. Most companies adopt repurchase programs, and they just say we're going to spend so much. That's like saying we're going you know, to we're gonna buy XYZ stock and we're going to spend so much or we're going to buy a company and we're going we're gonna to spend whatever it takes. Uh, we will buy stock when we think it is selling below a conservative estimate of its intrinsic value. Now, the intrinsic value is not a specific point. It's probably a range in my mind. Might have a band maybe of 10%. Charlie would have a band in his mind, and it would probably be 10%. And ours would not be identical, but they'd be very close. And sometimes he might figure a a bit higher than I do, a a bit lower. But we want to be sure when we repurchase shares that those people who have not sold shares are better off than they were before we repurchased them. In the first quarter of the year, they'll find we bought something over a billion dollars worth of stock and that's nothing like my ambitions but it what that means is that we feel that we're okay buying it but we don't salivate over buying it we think that the shares we repurchased in the first quarter leave the shareholders better off than if we hadn't the remaining shareholders better off than if we hadn't bought it but we don't think the difference is dramatic and you will you could easily see periods where we would spend very substantial sums uh, if we thought the stock was selling at, say, 25 or 30% less than it was worth and we didn't have something else that was even better. 
but we have no ambition in any given quarter to spend a dime unless we think you're going to be better off uh, for us having done so. Charlie? Well, I, I predict that we'll get a little more liberal in repurchasing shares. <laughs> I was going to give you equal time, but then... Uh, <laughs> Oh boy, how can you not just love Charlie Munger? So in the first quarter of 2019, Berkshire bought back $1.7 billion back in shares. And this is more than in 2018 altogether. So it sounds like it's a lot of shares, but for a company well over $500 billion in market cap, it's not really moving the needle. However, I think if you are an investor, it has a few important implications. So the first one might be obvious in the sense that Warren Buffett thinks that the stock is slightly undervalued compared to the market conditions. So if you want to be fully invested in equities with a strong focus on protecting your downside, Berkshire might be an option. Especially because Warren Buffett hints at using substantial sums if the stock is undervalued 25 to 30 percent. If he does not have any other place where he can put the money it would likely go into Berkshire, which again is a protection for you on the downside. Another question that was played here during the meeting, they even talk about putting as much as $100 billion in buying back shares. And I don't think you should be caught up too much in the numbers. That's really not the point. But more than Warren Buffett is really ready to apply all the money where it's put to the best possible use which is also why he does not want to allocate a fixed amount every year for share repurchase, as you see so many other companies are doing, because it is very interesting that if you go through various earnings calls, you hear so many times from management that they're saying that they might have paid out, say, $500 million in dividends and then bought back shares for another $500 million. And then they're saying they're proud of paying back or rewarding their investors with $1 billion for that quarter. For a value investor, that is sort of nonsense. I mean, if the $1 billion could be put to better use by reinvesting in the business or to make an acquisition, you're really not paying back the investor. You're actually destroying investor value. And I think the final implication is really how much the size of Berkshire Hathaway is constraining Warren Buffett. You know, if you have $100 billion in cash, there's just a limited amount of options for you. You can't put $100 billion to work in too many public companies. And one of the very few you can do that with, you know, that's a company like Berkshire. So buying back shares might mean that this is the best way to put the money into use, but it is in a very limited universe. So Stig, I'll be honest with you. This this response was just... Uh... I don't know. I was I was pretty frustrated listening to this. And it's not anything new that we haven't heard from previous shareholders meetings. Uh, I'm pretty sure you could pull up any shareholders meeting for the last 20 years and you're going to hear him talk about share repurchases and how the, the price has to be right and has to have the right intrinsic value or else they're not going to do it to bring shareholder value for the for the existing owners. Like He says that all the time. But Carol's question here, I thought was extremely well-framed. And I think it was well-framed in the fact that she's addressing the fact that he just keeps growing his cash pile and he's not buying any companies with it. He's not even buying his own stock with it. And um, what she's really getting at is if you're going to buy a little bit, and <laughs> by a little bit, I mean a billion, um, but that is a little bit in the grand scheme of how much he's sitting on. He's sitting over a hundred billion. So when you talk about it as a percent, that's less than one percent of buying his own stock back. So if you're going to buy less than one percent, why not buy ten percent or twenty percent? You know what it is that you're buying. So it's just a little confusing, and it sends mixed messages to the marketplace. So are you buying it because you think it's value, or are you buying it? For some other reason that just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I I was just very I'm frustrated with his response. And then I think whenever he handed it over to Charlie, and Charlie just, you know, Charlie's response was, I don't want to answer it, is really what he was doing. He's just like uh, he's just batting the, the question away as if um, 
he doesn't have to respond to it. And I think that they do need to respond to it because what they're effectively choosing is is they're saying, I think my cash gives me um, a better position than buying back my own stock. I don't know how else you could you could see it any other way. That's that's just me. I think that their actions speak way way louder than their words here, and I just think this was such a terrible response to such an important question that I've been looking at their actions for uh, a couple of years now, and it doesn't seem like they have a good response to it. And then, and you know, I, I will say this on on their behalf: a lot of the times. They don't like to publicly talk about why they are putting on certain positions. So this position of cash, um, maybe they think it's very advantageous to not be telling the market why they're sitting on so much cash and they're and they're valuing the optionality of that cash for some reason. And I think it's important to pay attention to that. So although although I'm frustrated with <laughs> their lack of uh, telling people why they're doing what they're doing. I am paying close attention to what they're doing and trying to understand it for myself. All right, so uh, I don't have anything else to add for this one, so we'll just go ahead and play the uh, next question here. Um, This question comes from Vincent James of Munich, Germany. There has been a lot written about the recent impairment charge at Kraft Heinz. You were quoted as stating that you recognize that Berkshire overpaid for Kraft Heinz. Clearly, major retail chains are being more aggressive in developing house brands. Amazon has announced intentions to launch grocery outlets, meaning that, as Mr. Bezos has often stated, your margin is my opportunity. The more fundamental question related to the Kraft Times may be whether the advantages of the large brands and the zero-based budgeting that 3G has applied are appropriate and defensible at all in consumer foods. In other words, will traditional consumer good brands in general, and Kraft Heinz in particular, have any moat in their future? My question is, to what extent do the changing dynamics in the consumer food market change your view on the long-term potential for Kraft Heinz? Actually, what I said was we paid too much for Heinz. Uh, I mean, Kraft, I'm sorry. The Heinz part of the transaction, when we originally owned about half of Heinz, we paid an appropriate price there, and we actually did well. We had some preferred redeemed and so on. Uh, we paid too much money for Kraft. To some extent, our own actions had driven up the prices. Now, Kraft Heinz, the profits of that business, $6 billion, we'll say very, very, very um, roughly. I'm not projecting them out. Uh, I'm not making forecasts. But $6 billion pre-tax on $7 billion of tangible assets is a wonderful business, but you can pay too much for a wonderful business. We bought C's candy and we made a great purchase as it turned out and we could have paid more, but there's some price at which we could have bought even C's candy and it wouldn't have worked. So the business does not know how much you paid for it. I mean, it's it's going to earn based on its fundamentals and we paid, we paid too much for the craft side of Kraft Heinz. Additionally, the profitability has basically been improved in those operations over the way they were operating before. But you're quite correct that Amazon itself has become a brand. Kirkland at Costco is a $39 billion brand. Now, all of Kraft Heinz does $26 billion, and it's been around for, on the Heinz side, it's been around for 150 years. And it's been advertised billions and billions of billions of dollars in terms of their products, and they go through tens of thousands of outlets. And here's somebody like Costco establishes a brand called Kirkland, and it's doing $39 billion more than virtually any food company. And that brand moves from product to product, which is terrific if a brand travels. I mean, Coca-Cola moves it from Coke to Cherry Coke and Coke Zero and so on. But to have a brand that can really move, and Kirkland does more business than Coca-Cola does. And Kirkland Act operates through 775 or so uh, stores, they call them warehouses at Costco, and Coca-Cola's through millions of distribution outlets. So brands, the retailer and the brands have always struggled as to who gets the upper hand in moving a product to the consumers. And 
there's no question in my mind that the position of the retailer relative to the brands, which varies enormously around the world and uh, in different countries, you've had 35%, even maybe 40% be private label brands and soft drinks, and it's never gotten anywhere close to that in the United States. So it, it varies a lot. But basically retailers, certain retailers, the retail system has gained some power and particularly in the case of Amazon and Walmart and their reaction to it, and Costco. Kraft Heinz is still doing very well operationally, but we paid too much. Well, we, uh, it's not a tragedy that out of two transactions, one worked wonderfully and the other didn't work so well. That happens. There can always be mistakes made when you've got places and you're rearranging, reorganizing them to do more business with them, with the same number of people. And we like buying businesses that are efficient to start with, but it's, the operations of Kraft Heinz have been improved under the, the present management overall. But uh, we paid a very high price in terms of, of the Kraft part. We didn't, we paid an appropriate price in terms of Heinz. Very interesting response. So. Back in 2015, Berkshire bought Kraft Heinz together with 3D Capital. And I know it's quite easy for us to say here in hindsight, but for quite a few value investors, it was sort of a big surprise how much Buffett really paid. At the time, it was around 25 times earnings of a company with a mid-digit growth and not really with an outlook of ramping up that growth. And for instance, for Heinz, a 20% premium to the price was added before the deal. Now, since then, you had an impairment charge of a little more than $15 billion. And this is primarily related to the US refrigerated food and Canadian retail divisions and the trademarks for Kraft and Oscar Myers. An impairment charge is really that the value of that has been written down. So you will have that less equity as an investor. Now, that being said, I think it's so liberating to hear the CEO of a huge company being so upfront and being completely honest with their mistake. It's sort of rare these days. Yeah, you know, Stig, I, I don't know that I really have too much to add to what was said during this one. I think that it's just important for people to hear his thought process, how he um, can reanalyze himself objectively. And I think that that's probably his, his, his super strength here is he can look at himself objectively and say, hey, this was a good decision. This was a bad decision unemotionally. And so many people can't do that. And I think that that's such an important part of his secret sauce of who he is and why he became who he is, uh, is because he's able to do that. So let's go ahead and uh, jump to the uh, next question here. I'm 27 years old and aspire to be a great money manager like you two one day. My question to both of you is how did you know you were ready to manage other people's money? Well, it's a very interesting question because I, I've faced that and I sold securities for a while, but in, in May of 1956, I had a number of members of my family. I'd come back from New York and they wanted me to help them out with stocks as I had earlier before I'd taken a job in New York. And I said, I did not want to get in the stock sales business. I, I enjoyed investing. I was glad to figure out a way to do it, which I did through a partnership form. But I would not have done that if I thought there was any chance, really, that I would lose the money. And what I was worried about was not how I would behave, but how they would behave because I, I needed people who were in sync with me. So when we sat down for dinner in May of 1956 with seven people who either were related to me or one was a roommate in college and his mother, and uh, I showed him the partnership agreement. I said, you don't need to read this. I said, here are the ground rules as to what I think I can do and how I want to be judged. And if you're in sync with me, I want to manage your money. I won't worry about the fact that you will panic if the market goes down or somebody tells you something different. So we have to be on the same page. And if we're on the same page, then I'm not worried about managing your money. And if we aren't on the same page, I don't want to manage your money because you may be disappointed when I think that things are even better to be investing and so on. So I don't think you want to manage other people's money 
until you have a vehicle and can reach the kind of people that will be in sync with you. I think you ought to have your own ground rules as to what your expectations are, when they should send you roses and when they should throw bricks at you. And a father-in-law that gave me everything he had in the world, you know, but, and I, I didn't mind taking everything he had in the world as long as he would stick with me and wouldn't get panicked by headlines. And it's enormously important that you don't take people that have expectations of you that you can't meet. And that means you turn down a lot of people. It means you'd probably start very small and you get an audited record. And when you've got the confidence where if your own parents came to you and they were going to give you all their money and you were going to invest for them, if you've got the kind of confidence that you'll say, I may not get the best record, but I'll be sure that you get a decent record over time, uh, that's when you're ready to go on it. The, uh, Let me tell you a story that I tell young lawyers who frequently come to me and say, how can I quit practicing law and become a billionaire instead? And so I say, well, it reminds me of a story they told about Mozart. A young man came to him and he said, I want to compose symphonies and I want to talk to you about that. And Mozart said, how old are you? And the man said, 22. And Mozart said, you're too young to do symphonies. And the guy says, but you were writing symphonies when you were 10 years old. He says, yes, but I wasn't running around asking other people how to do it. <laughs> We wish you well. And, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> and, we, and actually, we really do, because the fact you ask that sort of a question is, in, it, to some extent, indicative of the fact that you got the right attitude going in. <laughs> it isn't that easy to be a great investor. I don't think we've quite made it. So, Munger being a little harsh here, I don't think there's any issues with asking more experienced people for advice. But I think his point is more directed at there were quite a few questions at any Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting, which is more like, tell me what I should invest in. I don't want to put in the work to find the very best stocks. And it's just hard to find any successful money manager for good reasons who are giving away that information for free. But I really love Buffett's response here. As so many of our listeners, I considered a career in money management at some part in time. And I think Buffett's response really explains to us why so few people are venture successful. You know, 99 plus percent of corporate jobs in the money management industry is really in an environment where you're not truly matching the expectations with the investors. And you really can't remove that noise and that pressure from yourself. And having that on you is just going to be very, very difficult to be successful. So Buffett has a quote that he says, I'm a much better investor because I'm a business owner and I'm a much better business owner because I'm an investor. And so uh, this, this gentleman's question about uh, becoming an investment advisor or doing a partnership kind of like what uh, Buffett had done, managing other people's money. I would argue that one of the things that made Buffett so strong at understanding how investing works and finding these companies is because whenever he was a kid, going back to the Mozart example, you know, he, 10 years old, when Buffett was, you know, really young in his teens, he was out there throwing more newspapers than any other kid, you know, in America. He was, he, he was making tons of money as a kid. He was owning businesses. He had pinball machines. He was doing all, well, all sorts of business ventures. And so he was wired for it from the very beginning. He had he grew up with a business mind in the way he thinks about things. He didn't start off, you know, thinking that I'm going to be the nothing but stocks and manage other give me other people's money so that I can invest that in this passive way of owning businesses. No, he had a business. He had his, you know, the the pinball story is unbelievable. If you've never heard the pinball story, I'd look that up and uh, dig into it some more, but Buffett was running his own little micro businesses. He understood what it was to have a top line. He knew what it was to have net income or profit at the end of at the end of his expenses. And I think whenever you do that and you run a small business, you just approach your investments from a completely different lens than somebody who um, you know went off to school and maybe never ran a business ever. And they're, they're trying to buy passive investments and they've never run anything operationally and Buffett had. 
So it's always interesting to hear Charlie tell that story, the Mozart story. He really likes uh, telling that. I think I've heard him say that almost every single shareholder meeting that I've ever gone to. And I think it's an important story that he tells because there's a lot of truth to that. You have to be the person who's going out there and trying to get after it and trying to to build your own business. And you just can't, you got to learn from other people, but at the same time, you've got to have some experience of your own. And I think that's really kind of the point. All right. So uh, I don't have anything else to add for this one. So we'll just go ahead and play the uh, next question here. Question on technology and company's biggest holding now. Uh, given that Apple is now our largest holding, tell us more about your thinking. What do you think about the regulatory challenges the company faces, for example? Spotify has filed a complaint against Apple in Europe on antitrust grounds. Elizabeth Warren has proposed ending Apple's control over the App Store, which would impact the company's strategy to increase its services businesses. Are these criticisms fair? I will tell you that all of the things, the points you've made, I'm aware of, and I like our Apple holdings very much. I mean, it is our largest holdings. And actually, what hurts in the case of Apple is that the stock has gone up. And we'd much rather have the stock, and I'm not proposing anything be done about it, but we'd much have to, rather have the stock at a lower price so we could buy more stock. And importantly, if Apple, I think they authored another, authorized another $75 billion the other day, but let's say they're going to spend $100 billion in buying in their stock in the next three years. You know, it's very simple. If they buy it at 200, they're going to get 500 million shares. They've got 4 billion, 600 million out now. And so they'll end up with 4.1 billion under that circumstance. If they're buying it at 150, they buy in 667 million shares. And instead of owning what we would own the first case, we now, the divisor would be less than 4 billion and we'd own a greater percentage of it. So in effect, a, a major portion of earnings, at least possibly, has been, it's at least been authorized, will be spent in terms of increasing our ownership without us paying out a dime, which I love for a business, a, a wonderful business. And the recent development, when the stock has moved up substantially, actually hurts Berkshire over time. We, we'll still do, in my opinion, we'll do fine, but we're not going to get into uh, uh, we're not going to dissect our expectations about Apple, you know, for people who may be buying it against us tomorrow or something. We don't, we don't give away investment advice on that for nothing. But we have all the, pro- all the things you've mentioned, obviously, we, we know about. We know some, we, we've got a whole bunch of other variables that we crank into it. And we like the fact that it's our largest holding. Charlie? Well, in my family, the people who have Apple phones, it's the last thing they'll give up. It's not a bad item to have. So a very interesting response. Apple is by far Berkshire Hathaway's largest equity holding. It's worth around $40 billion, and it's more than 20% of the total equity portfolio. Now, as you could tell, Buffett is not too happy about commenting on the operational challenges. And this is not really because it's Apple. He has that as a very general rule. The key really to understand his response is also to understand the bigger picture of Berkshire's value and how Apple and his other top holdings play into this. And it was sort of interesting to hear Buffett's take on share repurchase, not just because Apple just approved a $75 billion buyback program, but because Tim Cook, as the CEO of Apple, had a conversation with Warren Buffett about just that. He actually said to Becky Craig from CNBC not too long ago that he had a list of the smartest people to guide him in various fields. And on top of that list, whenever it came to stock buyback, uh, that was Warren Buffett. And so he got his number and gave Buffett a call. And he was like, I don't know if he's going to pick up. Uh, But he did. And he said he was very grateful for Buffett's advice. Now, that being said, I think it's important to understand how to read Buffett's portfolio. Stocks are reported on a mark-to-market basis. So the price that is reported on the final day of that quarter, that is directly reflected into the stated earnings of that company. That's simply just the accounting rules. So for instance, for the first quarter here in 2019, the stock market has soared and Buffett has reported $21.7 billion in profit compared to a loss of $1.1 billion last year. 
those numbers are more or less irrelevant because a lot of that comes from Buffett's top portfolio that performed really, really well. The number you should rather be looking for is the operating earnings, which is the earnings from all the businesses that Berkshire Hathaway owns and which is worth more than Berkshire's entire equity portfolio. That number shows that the operating earnings is $5.5 billion and it has a modest 5% growth year over year. If you want to focus on his stock portfolio, my suggestion is really to focus on the top 10 of his holdings since the value of those are more than 80% of his total portfolio. But one of the key takeaways is really that accounting for operating businesses that is somewhat stable, whenever it comes from equities, is just all over the place. Apple has soared 30% this year. That will move the reported earnings in the short term, but not change the overall intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway. So for this one, Stig, I don't really have too much to uh, add based on what you had said. The only thing that I would say is whenever I'm looking at Apple today at the uh, just trying to do my own intrinsic value on what I think that this thing's worth, um, because he's talking about uh, Apple plowing a lot of their free cash flow, a lot of their uh, liquidity back into the business through share repurchases. I look at the current price being way better opportunity than the rest of the S&P 500 as far as the yield. I think you're getting a much higher yield by repurchasing Apple stock than you are investing that in the S&P 500 as an index, probably about twice to three times the return as the S&P 500. So that's, you know, those are great things. You can see why Buffett is really happy about that. Uh, And it doesn't involve him using his own liquidity in order to do it. So he can protect that optionality of his cash, yet Apple is just reinvesting in itself. So that's going to, that's going to be good for him. And you can see why he's probably pretty happy about that idea. All right, so let's go ahead and move out of this segment where we're covering the uh, Berkshire meeting and we'll go into a question from the audience. I hope you won't be too disappointed in the responses from Preston and me now that you listen to Buffett and Munger, but this question comes from Paul. Hi, Preston Stig. This is Paul from London. I've been looking at a company for a while now, and from what I can tell, the fundamentals are quite good. However, in the last year, I noticed this company taking on a tremendous amount of debt with a large portion of the debt used to fuel stock buyback. And I'm not quite sure how to interpret this. Can you please share your thoughts behind leverage buybacks, whether this might be a red flag or perhaps something else? Love your show. Keep up the good work. I think this is a great question, Paul, and especially at a time where buybacks are at an all-time high. I think there are situations where leverage buybacks can make sense. However, there are so few cases that my general rule is that unless you're really certain that the management are very, very good capital allocators, it's a red flag. Today, with a high valuation, you might already question why you want to buy back stock in the first place for so many companies. And if that's even fueled by debt, I would be even more concerned. It's really hard for me to come up with a rule for how often leveraged buyback is a wise decision, but it's definitely single digits. One example I'd like to highlight for leveraged buyback is Beth Bath Beyond. You know, in fiscal year 2015, they took on a $1.5 billion in debt, and they more or less used all that for buybacks. They actually repurchased for $2.2 billion. So including the income that they generated, more or less everything was just put into buying back stock. And they bought back shares primarily in the 60s range and even in the 70s, at a time when the company were competing fiercely with Amazon and was squeezed and needed to reinvest in their own business. So what has happened since? The business is now seeing severely declining profits. It was trading at $10 not too long ago. So really to sum up, Paul, unless you can make a conservative valuation of the company and you find it severely undervalued and you know that the management has a good track record for being good capital allocators, I would likely stay away from the company. It might be the first sign of a less competent management that is too short-term focused. So I have to agree with Stig here. Um, I don't think that it's a good sign whenever you see a company acting in that way. I think it might be also, you're seeing so many uh, buybacks right now. And I think with interest rates as low as they are, you're seeing companies that feel like maybe they can they can pull this off without too much of a concern where they're, where they're basically borrowing money, then they're paying a dividend and they're just acting strange like this. 
I just don't think that it's good fundamentals. And I think that it's something that should definitely raise some red flags. I would love to know the ticker so I could give you better advice than just generic advice. But I definitely think it's something that should be on your radar and something that you should pay very close attention to. The only caveat that I would add to that is it obviously comes down to how much the uh, company is borrowing relative to their ability to operationally and quickly pay that off. Uh, and how much other debt the, the the business has. So if they don't have a lot of debt in other areas and they're doing this and they can easily say their debt to equity ratio is really low or they have a, um, a very reasonable current ratio, um, those kind of things would give you an idea of how much is too much. And uh, you just got to take it all. This is this is why we say you can't use just one metric or one ratio in order to determine whether something's good or bad. You have to kind of look at all the, the interdependencies of these variables. But I would look at some of those kind of things to help you determine whether it's a little too much. All right, Paul. So as a token of our appreciation, we're going to give you access to one of our free courses on the TIP Academy page on our website. The course that we're going to give you is our intrinsic value course. And our intrinsic value course teaches people how to determine the value of an individual stock. It also teaches you how to think about the market cycle and when you're buying your stock. And it also teaches you some stuff about options trading. So uh, we're really excited to give you this course. If anybody else out there wants to check out the course, you can go to tipintrinsicvalue.com or you can just go to our website and click on Academy link at the top of the page and course is right there. So if anyone else wants to leave a question on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com. And if your question gets played on the show, you'll get a free course. All right, guys, that was all the press that I had for this week's episode of the Investors Podcast. We really look forward to playing the second episode about this year's Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholders meeting next week. Thanks for listening to TIP. To access the show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. To get your questions played on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com and win a free subscription to any of our courses on TIP Academy. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the TIP Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Be, 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 be